Hey, Pastor Eric Colser here. I hope that this sermon resource will bless you in addition to your participation in a local church. If you've been checking us out online and you're not a part of a church family, we'd love to meet you and get to know you in person. But again, we pray and hope that this blesses you and helps build you up to be sent out on Jesus' mission. Again, we'll be in uh, Hosea chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Uh, Hosea the prophet, and we're going to uh, kind of lay out a big timeline in a moment as things have led up to a Hosea. But I think of being a prophet a lot like being a dad. So I've got three young boys, and uh, I consider the idea of being a prophet. Uh, my job as a dad is I say things very gently. I say, hey, buddy, stop doing that. 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 Dad, why are, you la- why, are you, why are you screaming? That's pretty much in summary of what it means to be a dad, right? Uh, that you are giving these warnings. They're not hearing. They're not listening. And then finally, you get their attention. And Hosea is a lot like that story um, where God is getting the attention of his people. And so if you were not here last week, I highly encourage you go back and listen to that. Uh, It is an amazing story where God tells his prophet Hosea to go and marry an unfaithful wife. That is an incredible story, an incredible thing to suggest. And we may have the temptation to think of that story uh, metaphorically. That we would say, oh, it's a parable. Uh, this, this was a real story. The, the prophet used his life set apart for God for God's message. It was a real story that unfolded. And that story, very directly, and we're going to see it even more directly in this passage, overlays the story of Israel. And God's love for Israel that he has married an unfaithful person, an unfaithful people. And then that story, yet again, overlays our story. That God has loved us, and yet we have been unfaithful. But the theme remains the same, that God is faithful. And that is is the message of of Hosea. And and so I want to spend a moment as we uh, begin, let me read verse 1. It says this, Say to your brothers... You are my people, and to your sisters, you have received mercy. That language is very intentional that Hosea uses. He even used it in chapter 1. That language is the same that we hear in 1 Peter chapter 2. It says, once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you had received mercy. Deuteronomy chapter 7, understand therefore that the The Lord your God is indeed God. He is the faithful one who keeps his covenant for a thousand generations and lavishes love on those who obey him and his commands. So when God makes a promise, he does so in a way that is not a promise like we would. It is a covenant, an unbreakable promise. And it's unbreakable on his part. And he is the one who holds it and keeps it. And so when we preach the Old Testament, uh, it is a, and when we study the Old Testament, we do so kind of with one hand tied behind our back, right? Because we have the great benefit that we stand on the finished work of Christ's side of time, that we look back. So when Hosea is giving his prophecy, he knows that he is looking forward to the coming Messiah. And so when we dive into Hosea, We see from his vantage point, but there is no hiding it, that Hosea is one of the more magnificent pictures of the gospel that exists in all of Scripture. That God is faithful even when we are unfaithful. To understand Hosea, uh, we have to see it kind of in the grand narrative of Scripture. It only makes sense that way when you see it in the whole picture of Scripture. And so I want to uh, spend a few minutes, and it's going to take a couple minutes to get through it. But I think it'll be helpful. I think it'll be helpful for this, but I think it'll be helpful for you just in general as you, as you understand uh, the Bible as a whole story that is unfolding. 
Um, and so I want to start and, and, and work our way to where Hosea fits in the big picture of the Bible, okay? So I want to start where every great story starts at the beginning. Uh, and so I've got a couple, a couple graphics that are going to kind of flash um, on. They're kind of small and hard to read, but you'll figure it out. Um, here um, on the far left, we start with creation. And we, we know the story that God created the world and everything that is in it. And then very quickly, uh, the s sin enters in and Satan's temptation. And God gives a word about what is good and true. But man, and Adam and Eve said, I think I know better. And so sin comes in. And then from there, God sends them into exile and kicks them out of the garden. Uh, from there, beginning this first cycle that we would see happen time and time again throughout Scripture. And things get worse. Soon Cain kills Abel. Soon things are so bad that God says, i got to hit the, the reset button. And we're going to have a flood. Uh, because things have gotten so far uh, from what it means uh, to be uh, honoring me and following me. And so that we get down to the flood. And then after that, you think, oh, well, this should be it. They'll get it figured out from here. Uh, and then we work our way down to the Tower of Babel, where yet again, uh, the people have gone so far and strayed. And so God tears down the power, Tower of Babel and, and, and casts everyone in all directions in different languages. Yet again, another form of exile. Uh, and this continues, and then God, yet again, does another cycle where he brings on Abraham and Sarah, and here gives a great picture of wonderful leaders, but yet sin is involved, compromise is involved. And he makes a promise to Abraham. He says, I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing, and uh, I will be your God. That's, that's an, uh, the first understanding of this covenantal love that exists, this promise that God would keep throughout all generations. You know, things go a little better for a while, but then they begin to mess up. Uh, so much so that after a few generations, God's people end up exiled in Egypt. So we're kind of picking up now into the book of Exodus. Uh, end, of, end of Genesis, beginning of Exodus. Um, and then God raises up Moses to rescue his people from slavery. So we're moving along the timeline here. And Moses, one of the great leaders in all of Scripture, a man of God. And, and here, uh, God continues the covenant language. I will take you as my own. I will be you, your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of slavery, of the Egyptians. So from here, God has done these amazing things for his people under Moses. But before long, the cycle goes again. Things go bad. Idols are made. From here, God's people, instead of going immediately into the promised land, spend 40 years in exile where? In the desert. Now we pick up under Joshua's leadership as they enter into the promised land. And you would assume now's the time things are going to go great. That we finally have gotten there. Uh, but they don't. The cycles continue uh, where, where uh, godly leaders and, 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 and God's people do well and then they're replaced with sin and idolatry. Then comes on the time of judges who everyone chooses to do what is right in their own eyes. And then we have, well, judges don't work, so let's get some kings. And they start out with a king that seems good at first, but then goes horribly wrong. And then we come to a great king. Not a perfect king, but a great king in King David. And God makes another promise. And in this promise, he says, on your throne, what is called the Davidic covenant, there will be a king... Who will reign forever? And we know that Jesus comes in the line of David later, right? So this whole story, all the way from Abraham, is starting to unfold. That is now pointing a picture in a direction towards the cross. That is pointing a picture to the risen and ascended King Jesus. 
So there's a, a stark period following uh, the reign of David and the reign of his son Solomon that seemed to go very well, but then after that fall into yet again another cycle. Uh, the, 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 the northern and southern kingdom, there's a civil war that breaks out. And so the, the, there's, uh, Israel's broken into two sections. And Eric talked a bit about la that last week. But things start to go pretty horribly wrong. And, and things get so bad that both par uh, parties are now starting to be known for their idolatry. Uh, they're starting uh, to serve a, a god named Baal. And the other... Uh, is, is, is making idols of gold that are to be worshipped. And they're known for this, and things get really bad. And this is where you pick up in the story of like kings and start reading about um, uh, Elijah and some of the, the great stories that are unfolding. So it's still moving along, right? Then we, we come to uh, an era after this where the prophets start to speak. And the prophets start to give these warnings that the people of God should turn from their idols and turn to God. And this is exactly where we pick up Hosea. Is that helpful? Is that, you following? And then we're going to kind of stop there. We know it doesn't stop there ultimately. Right? We're going to march to the cross eventually. Uh, but this helps us figure out where we are. Hosea's narrative uh, is, is one that centers on God's unending love uh, towards a sinful, unfaithful, adulterous people. Here, the prophetic efforts of this book can be summed up in the passage, I have been the Lord your God ever since you were in the land of Egypt. You know no God but me, and besides me there is no Savior. Hosea's job was to speak these words during a time where they had been essentially forgotten. It was only a few hundred years before this that God brought them out of slavery, between the waters, into the promised land. And they had been utterly all but forgotten and turned away to worship others. So I go all of that way to repeat again. Say to your brothers, you are my people. And to your sisters, you have received mercy my paraphrase, remember this because it's about to get real and I'm about to tell you how it really is and I'm going to let you have it. That's where we're starting now. The second point we come to this morning is the story of Hosea tells the real consequence of sin. The chapter starts off with Hosea no longer speaking to his wife, but passing messages through his children, the ones with the judgmental names that were mentioned in chapter 1. He says, plead, in verse 2, plead with your mother, for she is not my wife and I am not her husband. The same exact phrasing as you are not my people and I am not your God, which is the same exact phrasing that says you are my people and you are my God. He continues in this relational process of showing how far Israel has gone away from the God that loves them. This would have been an understood at that moment as a declaration of, of divorce. It says, you are not my wife. It doesn't say, I'm not your husband. It's saying, you have left. You have quit your role. I have not quit my role, but it could be understood at that moment the idea that divorce was happening, but that was not so. It was a statement that the mother had left the worship, that it was only given to God. The relationship that was between Hosea and Gomer was a direct understanding of God's relationship of Israel. So she had left that relationship with Hosea. Israel had left that relationship but the message of the prophet, or God to the prophet Hosea was to, you will love that unfaithful, adulterous lover, your spouse. Let's continue on. Um, I want to preface this. It's about to get a little rated R. We're, we can be mature in this. 
uh, but it's going to get a little uh, severe, a little adult, a little rated R. Uh, sin has a way of destroying identity, and sin always creates separation. And the language here is extreme, because if you consider what is occurring, there is nothing more severe than this. Verse 2, and she put away her whoring from her face, again rated R, and her adultery from between her breast, lest I strip her naked and make her as the day she was born, and make her like a wilderness, and make her like a parched land, and kill her with thirst upon her children. I will have no mercy, which is interesting because he's speaking to the kids right now, so that's got to be a little interesting. <laughs> because they are children of whoredom. For their mother has played the whore. She who conceived them acted shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers who give me my bread and my water and my wool and my flax and my oil and my drink. You see the whoredom, the prostitution. I will go after that which gives me. Exchanging that for worship. It has only been, as I mentioned, a few hundred years since the Exodus, and the people have fully uh, began worshiping other gods and idols. The language here is severe, but if you consider it, rightfully so. It is also intentional and in interesting that God communicates this severity in the terms of a relationship. Isn't that amazing? God could choose to say, I am God and you are my people and you should worship me out of position, power, status. But he does so out of a relationship. He does so saying the best picture of our relationship is like a marriage. That, that, that really communicates the heart of God. It communicates the desire for relationship with you that God has and the purpose and design for which is to be experienced. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall not have any other gods beside me. Do you know what that was? That was the first commandment. God takes it kind of serious when you start to worship other gods and other idols. So much so that he put it first on his list. And now we come to his people who have become adulterous. They're loving another. They're, they're now in a relationship with another God, another idol. And God does become jealous. God, God does become se severe that that love is reserved for him. The idea that Gomer's whoring around, Israel's Abandoning could be literal, but they are one clear message that you have left, that you have left me, that you are cheating on me, that you are giving to another what belongs alone to me. And there'll be application at the end, but I need to pause and say right now, what is it that you are giving to another that belongs only to God? What is it that you are cheating on God for? And you're like, ah, it's not really that severe. Oh yeah, it is. It's right here. God sees that as an adulterous action. When you give to another that which belongs to him. Now we come to this severe language that God shows as a consequence. Regret is sorrow over consequence of sin, but it is not necessarily over the sin itself. If there had been no consequences, there would have been no sorrow. There is no sorrow 
over the sin for what it is itself. How it grieves God. How it violates the relationship from Him. Oftentimes, I think of my kids getting in trouble. Are they in trouble? Uh, are they upset because of the punishment? Or are they upset because of the sin? You see the difference? Are we upset when things go badly? Are we upset because God, we have violated our relationship and worship with God? So James chapter 1 talks about this. In verse 14 through 16 it says, But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when the desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So there are five stages to sin. The first is it begins with an evil desire. Something catches your eye that is dishonoring, unholy, evil, not yours. The next is the evil desire conceives. It gains the consent of the will. And when that happens, sin is born. And sin has a life of its own. So no sin is an end to itself. It grows. It grows. And it, from there, it produces death. I know it feels a little heavy this morning. There is some part to which that's intentional. Because... Our sin will lead to death. Our sin will lead to separation from God. Galatians says this. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that also he will reap. For the one who sows in his own flesh will, will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows in the spirit will from the spirit reap eternal life. So when you embrace and turn towards the things of God, you receive the great blessing. When you go and worship another, that leads to sin, destruction, and death. There's real consequence for sin. Now listen to this. Forgiveness is available. But consequence is not erased by forgiveness. You with me? Imagine this, you run up a bunch of credit card bills, and then all of a sudden you're like, oh Lord, that was wrong, I did wrong, that was, I should not take on that debt, I should have not uh, bought into whatever thing it is to which I, I need to repent and experience the, the forgiveness of God, and, and you turn to God and, and, and you need to be forgiven, and you do, and God forgives you. The consequence is you still got to pay your balance. There's still consequence for that. There's still consequence uh, for sin that exists. And, and you can carry that because in any sin that exists, there are consequences. And if you keep pulling the string of sin, you start to excavate where it is attached to and the idols to which it is attached and when you pull it, you start to see and expose it for what it is. You bring it into the light. And that is a good practice. Because in that point, you can now apply the gospel to it. And God can not only deal with the forgiveness, but uproot the idol. You see, it is not until the cycle-breaking work of King Jesus, the promised king who would sit on the throne forever, that the cycles would break. Israel would have occasional moments, but much at the hands of the prophets. And then they even liked killing the prophets. They would experience exile and captivity. But the promised Messiah would break those cycles. I, as I studied this week, I got into a question and even a, um, a time of, of long discussion with my wife. I said, could Israel even have been faithful? And I thought, well, could we even be faithful? 
And I, and I just kept going. And, and I thought, well, what is the difference now than then? And many were faithful. You know, we look back to Abraham as a great picture of that. And in that, um, that God, people are just complicated. And life's long. But what does it mean to follow Christ? Now listen, there is a difference today. There is hope. We stand now on the other side of the finished work of Christ. That, that the power over sin has been broken. Not the temporary sacrificial system that would be required again and again, but a once and for all sacrifice for sin. That frees us from the power of sin, Satan, and death. We don't stop there. What do we have now that they did not have then? We have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Jesus himself says, it's even better that I go because the helper will come. And so it is through the residing presence of God in you that you can receive that power to overcome. And then thirdly, we have a benefit today. We have the church. That Jesus is the head of the church and he's given the church as a gift uh, to us that we might experience what it means uh, to grow with one another, to care with one another, and in that, uh, to bring that accountability, but also the ability to pursue. And we see that in the book of Acts, that the church begins to flourish at the moment of the Holy Spirit and the, and the launching of the church. And so, yes, we can, with hope, look and say we can be faithful. Um, to an extent with God's help, um, but we know one who is ultimately faithful, one who was without sin, who, who was ultimately faithful, which was Jesus. If you look throughout Scripture, the Bible goes to great efforts to basically show all the great people throughout biblical history as flawed, all but one. That was Jesus. All but one, that Jesus was faithful that was without sin, and took on sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God. That's the great benefit of standing on this side of the cross. Let us continue on down. The story of Hosea communicates God's relentless pursuit. In, in verse 6, it says, Therefore I will hedge up the way with thorns and I will build a wall against her so that she cannot find her paths. She shall pursue her lovers but not overtake them and she shall seek them but not find them. And she shall say, I will go and return to my first husband before it was better for me than it is now. So this, that God does pursue us but it's not always in the way that we want. Here it says that God puts thorns around your entire life in all directions but one. One that leads to God. And maybe in your life you have pursued directions and you have landed and been ensnared in those thorns. And then you turn and you try another direction. And it's unsatisfying, unfulfilling. Uh, you can think through that God even walls off your directions, that there is no direction that will satisfy except the one that is open and clear, that is to the cross, that is to God. And that those thorns are there. You see those thorns as, as struggles. Those thorns are there that, may, that they may tell you this doesn't work. That you must turn towards Christ. You can get trapped there. You can get injured there. You can get scarred there. But you must turn towards Christ, the path that is open. And God puts those there on purpose. We don't like to hear that. Well, God spoke softly. Hey, don't do that, turn to me. Hey, don't do that, turn to me. Hey, don't do that, turn to me. And even louder. 
We are his children. He is our father. His desire is for relationship. The language here is the same that happens in Luke chapter 15 and the prodigal son story. Let me read for you verse 17. It says, But when he came to himself, this is the prodigal son who had went off from the father, and he said, How many of my father's hired uh, servants have more than enough bread? Yet I perish here with hunger of his own doing. He'd squandered all of his inheritance. And now he is eating uh, the food of, of pigs. And he says, I will arise and go to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And I told this to my wife. I said, I think this is my favorite verse in all of scripture. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, the father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. Is there a more beautiful phrase in all of scripture than, but while he was still a long way off? He arose, and he came, and he felt compassion. It, it, it is this, the gospel. It is the story of Hosea. It is the story of God and Israel woven and laid under the story of Hosea and Gomer. And it is our story that, that we had chosen our own way. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue, pursue me all the days of my life. That comes from Psalm chapter 23, the well-known psalm that God will pursue, pursue us all the days of our life. Now listen to this, Job chapter 10 gets a little more thorny. If I am guilty, woe to me. If I am in the right I cannot lift up my head, for I am filled with disgrace, and I look upon my affliction. And were my head lifted up, you would hunt me like a lion. And again, work wonders against me. You renew your witnesses against me and increase your vexation toward me. You bring fresh troops against me. This is Job talking about the idea that sin would exist in him and that God has set out on him like a roaring lion to attack him. That he has set out troops. And the reason and the goal that that has happened is not that you might be devoured or destroyed, it's that God has pursued you with that intensity to bring you back into relationship with himself. So I don't know where it is right now where God is hunting you like a lion. But you need to turn to Christ. You need to turn from sin and turn to Christ. The last point is this. The story of Hosea is a story of idolatry, wrong worship, and missed blessings. Let's start in verse 8. And she, she said, and she did not know that it was I who gave her grain and the wine and the oil, who lavished on her silver and gold, which they used for Baal. Oh, she thought it was her lovers that was providing for her. And God said it. She didn't know that it was me that was providing for her. And you used that which I gave you, silver and gold. This is going back actually to the story of, of when they made the golden calf. God gave them this, <clears throat> this gold, which when they had it, they then made a, a, an idol 
of using that gold. Very direct. Verse 9, Therefore I will take back my grain in its time, and my wine in its possession, and I will take away my wool and my flax, which were here to cover nakedness, and I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and no one shall rescue her out of my hand. And I will put an end to all of her mirth and her feast, her new moons, her Sabbaths, and all her appointed feast. And I will lay waste uh, her vines and her fig trees, for which she said, These are my wages, which my lovers have given me. I will make them a forest, and the beasts of the field shall devour them. And I will punish her for the feast of days of the Baals, when she burned offerings to them and adorned herself with her ring and jewelry and went after her lovers and forgot me, declares the Lord. Remember the first commandment. There's no other gods. And now his people have gone about worshiping other gods. And not only that, they're using that which God has given them to worship those gods. And so consider your life. What are your skills? What are your abilities? What are your passions? What are your job? The knowledge that you have, your money, your resources, the positions you have, the provisions that God has given, the relationships, the family, the marriage, the kids, your time. Those are all gifts given to you by God and are you using them to worship God or are you using them to worship idols? Whew. When they have used the gifts that God has given for sin and forgotten Him. Isaiah 65 2 says, Spread out my hands all the day to rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, following their own devices. Psalm 81, but my people would not listen to me and Israel would not obey me. Psalm 81 verse 12, so I gave them up to their stubborn hearts to follow their own devices. Proverbs 1, because you refused my call and no one took my outstretched hands. Isaiah 1. Listen, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have raised children and brought them up, and they have rebelled against me. Sin is not just the breaking of God's law. It is the breaking of God's heart. We must learn to read Scripture in the right way. We must see ourselves as the right character. You know, oftentimes in kids' books, they tell the story of David and Goliath. And if you ever read the story of David and Goliath, and maybe you do so now, you think of yourself as David, who slings the rocks and hits the giant, and you defeat the giants in your life. You're not David. You're not David. You were the scared soldier that got to go on the field when David defeated the giant. Sometimes you might read this story and think that you're Hosea. Oh, I could never, I could never uh, forgive an adulterous spouse. You're not Hosea in this story. You're Gomer. We must learn to read Scripture rightly. We are Israel. We are the unfaithful spouse. So here's the question and main point in conclusion. So why is God even still involved? Why doesn't he destroy them? Why doesn't he just give up on them? Why doesn't God destroy us? Why doesn't God give up on us? And the reason why is he made us a promise that he would be our God and we would be his people. That is the story of Hosea. That we would be in relationship with our God. That we would experience 
the saving, redeeming pursuit of the God who created us for relationship. And that would be experienced and realized in the finished work of Christ. That we would turn towards Jesus. So it, in all of this, the result is the same. That you would turn to Jesus. That if you have given to another that which is reserved from God, turn from your sin and turn to Jesus. If you have never trusted Christ, that you would turn from your sin and you would believe on the finished work of Jesus this day. So the main point is that God keeps his promises. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the story of Hosea and Gomer. And even today, the heavy reading of the text that leads us to a place of, of lament as we consider our own idolatry, our own sin, our own times that we have worshipped other things. Father, we, in this moment, thank you. We thank you that we stand on this side of the cross, that we can look on it, that you see Jesus, that you now allow us to experience your Holy Spirit at work in us. Father, we repent. We turn. Father, help us to not be like Israel. Help us to not be like Gomer. But Father, we know we have sin that has surrounded us. Father, let us take the path that leads to Christ. And Father, may we be reminded of your great promises. That you are our God and we are your people. And we worship you for all of who you are and all that you have done. And we worship you as our Savior. We worship you as the King who now sits on the throne, who rules and reigns, who has conquered sin and death, that we might experience the renewed relationship with you. Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.